Hello everyone, RJM3 here. Welcome back to What If, the alternate history series where I speculate what could have been if history had gone differently. So you all have probably already heard what's going on in Eastern Europe. How on February 24th, 2022, after months of Russian troops being moved to the Ukrainian border and phony accusations of Ukraine being a Western puppet run by drug-addicted neo-Nazis, Russia invaded Ukraine, beginning the first land war in Europe since the 90s, killing thousands of people, creating millions of refugees, and started a new crisis between NATO and Russia that could potentially end in nuclear war. But how did we get here? Why, after 30 years, have tensions between Russia and the West not subsided? Well, perhaps the issue remains deeply embedded into Russian society itself. Going back to the 1990s, following the collapse of the Soviet Union and the founding of the Russian Federation, Russia's economy promptly collapsed as corruption in newly privatized businesses had run rampant, leading to widespread poverty and organized crime. Now, these events are often interpreted and used by tankies on the internet as proof that communism was better than capitalism after all, but that simply is not the case. In fact, the rampant corruption in Russian society actually predates not just the fall of the USSR, but the founding of Russia itself. Going further back to the 13th century, the Kievan Rus, the predecessor to the states of Ukraine, Belarus, and Russia, was a kingdom with close ties to the Byzantine Empire and structurally no different than the rest of Europe. But in 1237, the Kievan Rus was invaded, looted, and subjugated by the Mongol Empire. Russian princes were pressured by their Mongol overlords to heavily tax the peasantry with increased ferocity, creating an incredibly repressive social hierarchy, which persisted even after the Grand Duchy of Moscow unified Russia and kicked out the Mongols in 1480. Unlike Europe, which slowly shifted from feudalism to republicanism over the centuries, Russia continued to be ruled by one tyrannical strongman, or woman, in an absolutist system, maintained with the cooperation of a corrupt class of aristocrats and the army. Even after the Russian Empire collapsed and the monarchy had been overthrown in 1917, the culture of a strongman dictatorship still continued. Vladimir Putin is just the latest in a long line of Russian strongmen. When the switch from a centrally planned economy to a free market economy was made in the late Soviet era, all of the lucrative state-owned industries, rather than ended up in the hands of capable, business-savvy individuals like in many former Eastern Bloc countries, instead ended up in the hands of former high-ranking Communist Party members and their friends and lackeys, creating the modern-day class of Russian oligarchs. Authoritarianism and corruption was so deeply entrenched into the Russian system on every level, from the legislature, to the military, to the police, and so on, that the prospect of a liberal reform would be daunting and practically impossible. And because of this, Europe and the world stands on the edge of Armageddon. But what if it didn't have to be this way? What if Russia didn't remain such a hostile actor on the world stage? What if the power of the oligarchs and the culture of corruption within the Russian state just disappeared. While I could speculate what if the Mongols never invaded the Kievan Rus, such a world would be too different and too divorced from our own. The point of this video is to imagine what a better, more peaceful present day for Ukraine, Russia, and Europe would look like, one we could all be living in right now. So, what if the Russian Federation had a function in democracy? <laughs> So how exactly could Russia overcome its systemic issues? Perhaps the Federation's first president, Boris Yeltsin, is simply a better, more proactive leader and dedicates his term as president to root out corruption regardless of how monumental such a task might be. Perhaps there are more younger, Western-influenced reformers within the government who would support Yeltsin's efforts. And perhaps, through sheer dumb luck, a large number of corrupt officials who would oppose said reforms conveniently fall victim to a series of freak accidents. So, how would the 90s in Russia play out differently? September 1993. In our timeline, the Supreme Soviet, Russia's legislature at the time, opposed Yeltsin's economic reforms. So Yeltsin decided to dissolve the Supreme Soviet and call for new elections. The Supreme Soviet retaliated by barricading themselves inside Russia's legislative building, the White House, and voted to impeach Yeltsin. This was done with the support of the Communist National Salvation Front and the fascist Russian National Unity Movement. Protests erupted in the streets of Moscow against Yeltsin, severely hurting his popularity. 
It all ended with Yeltsin ordering the military to shell the White House. The opposition was arrested, the Supreme Soviet was dissolved and replaced by the Federal Assembly, and the Constitution was rewritten to bestow greater power to the presidency, which Putin would gladly take advantage of a few years later. But in this alternate timeline, the 1993 constitutional crisis never happens. Not only is the Supreme Soviet more open to economic reform and even political reform, but Yeltsin, being a better man, is unwilling to trample democratic institutions to get what he wants. As a result, the Supreme Soviet continues to exist, more checks and balances are made within the Russian government, the transition to capitalism is made a lot easier, and Russian markets become less friendly for organized crime. Back in September 1991, a few months before the fall of the Soviet Union, the Chechens, a predominantly Muslim ethnic minority group located in the Caucasus, declared their independence from Russia, forming the Chechen Republic. However, unlike the many other former Soviet republics, Russia never recognized Chechen independence. In December 1994 of our timeline, after months of escalating tensions, botched clandestine activities, and genocide, Russia invaded Chechnya, the start of the First Chechen War. But despite Russia's greater military strength, Chechen guerrilla fighters were able to exhaust and demoralize the Russians, forcing a massive retreat from their country. Why does that all sound so familiar? Russia declared a ceasefire in August 1996, and eventually signed a peace treaty with Chechnya, in which Russia recognized Chechnya's boundaries, but not its independence, apparently, leaving both countries back at square one. Yeltsin essentially kicked the can down the road, leaving the issue of Russo-Chechen relations unresolved and contentious, which Putin would gladly take advantage of a few years later. But in this alternate timeline, Yeltsin, recollecting the disaster that was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, tries a more subtle approach. Yeltsin formally recognizes Chechnya's independence, but utilizes espionage and economic incentives to influence Chechen politics. Chechnya is swayed into the Russian sphere of influence and joins the Commonwealth of Independent States and the Collective Security Treaty Organization. 1999. Yeltsin's second term is coming to an end, and the election to decide Russia's next president is only a year away. In our timeline, in August of that year, Chechen Islamists infiltrated the Russian region of Dagestan and declared it an independent state, starting the Second Chechen War. On August 9th, Putin was appointed to the position of Prime Minister by Yeltsin. In September, four apartment buildings across Russia were bombed allegedly by Chechen terrorists, which killed 307 people. On December 31st, due to incredible unpopularity with the public, Yeltsin resigned as president, and so Prime Minister Putin was sworn in as acting president, which he would serve until the election, which had been moved from June to March due to Yeltsin's resignation. January 13, 2000. Putin announces his candidacy for president as an independent. After campaigning on anti-Chechen rhetoric, vowing to avenge the apartment bombings, and finally to reintegrate Chechnya back into Russia, not to mention having a corrupt media to sing his praises, Putin won the 2000 election with 53.4% of the vote. Allegedly. In this alternate timeline, however, none of what I just said could possibly happen. Russo-Chechen tensions have already been solved. There simply cannot be an invasion of Dagestan. No new Chechen war, and no apartment bombings. Yeltsin, seeing Putin as a dangerously power-hungry man, never appoints him to be prime minister. Due to higher popularity with the public, Yeltsin never resigns. When the election comes around in June, Putin doesn't really have much of a platform to run on, or a corrupt media to back him up, and soundly loses. Gennady Zayuganov, of the Communist Party of the Russian Federation, who came in second place in our timeline, would also lose the election. Because of the easier transition to capitalism, a generally more positive outlook on the post-Soviet era, and far less nostalgia for the days of the Soviet Union. Instead, the election is won by Grigory Yavlinsky of the socially liberal Russian United Democratic Party, or Yabloko. The election of Yavlinsky is the final step in Russia's transition from a backwards oligarchy to a modern republic. Yavlinsky was the most pro-Western candidate, so under his presidency, Russia would spend the early 2000s mending relations with European countries. Yavlinsky, however, was still skeptical of NATO, and was also the only candidate who opposed the Second Chechen War in our timeline, so he would vigorously oppose the Iraq War in 2003, like how Putin did in our timeline, but for very different reasons. 2008. In our timeline, this was the year Russia invaded Georgia in order to prevent Georgia from joining NATO and to intimidate Ukraine from also joining NATO. 
But in this alternate timeline, President Yavlinsky, assuming he wins a second term, would be firmly against using force to keep Russia's neighbors in line. In fact, without such a hostile Russia, Georgia and Ukraine would not even have a reason to join NATO. Countries like Ukraine and Georgia might actually be more willing to cooperate with a more diplomatic Russia. After all, you catch more flies with honey than vinegar. Also, without having to worry so much about antagonizing Russia by getting too close to the West, Ukraine could likely join the European Union because money. With a robust economy and overall better morale across the country, alcoholism starts to fall all across Russia. But what about Russia's allies from our timeline, Belarus and Syria? Since the 1990s, Belarus, bearing the same problems of authoritarianism and corruption Russia has, has been under the dictatorial rule of Alexander Lushenko, which has been largely propped up by Putin. But without Putin, Belarus instead would be a total pariah state, perhaps eventually succumbing to revolution. Syria, which has been under the presidency of Bashar al-Assad since 2000, collapsed into civil war during the Arab Spring in 2011. In our timeline, Russia has assisted Assad's government by helping bomb the rebels. But in this alternate timeline, Russia would have never supported Assad, and his government would be left in a much more precarious situation in the ongoing conflict. 2016. In this alternate timeline, in the aftermath of the U.S. presidential election, without Putin, there are never any accusations that Trump colluded with Russia to win the election. I mean, realistically, due to America's incredibly polarized state, Trump would still get accused of cheating, just not with the help of Russia. By the 2020s, the United States, European Union, and Russia are all on pretty good terms. America and Russia's nuclear stockpiles have been drastically decreased. Ukraine remains unravaged by war. Peace on the European continent has never been more secure. With no hostile actors on the European stage, the purpose of NATO would have been increasingly scrutinized and may have even been dissolved most likely during the Trump presidency, with America turning its full attention away from countering Russia in Europe and towards countering China in Asia and the Pacific. The hostilities between the West and Russia from the Cold War are but a distant memory. Now they can all work together to create a better, freer, and safer world. Unfortunately for us, such a world is too good to be true. This is all just wishful thinking. Obviously, this scenario of Russia overcoming its structural and cultural flaws so quickly isn't very realistic. But regardless, it's important to remember to not let your country's past define its future. As long as there are Russians willing to oppose, to protest, to undermine Putin's regime, younger Russians who genuinely want to break the cycle of tyranny and finally create a Russia that is truly free, then there is hope that this scenario may one day no longer be an alternate history. This has been RJM3, Alternate Historian. Have a nice day.